Good evening, everybody. My name is Marvin Four. I'm a cycling coach and the owner of Alpine Coles. And the presentation this evening is all about how to get your best result at the Marmot. So welcome to the presentation. You've all been training hard for the past few months, certainly. Uh, and hopefully you're feeling on top form for Saturday. My focus in this presentation, of course, is not at all to come back on training in any way, shape or form, but it's all about how you can achieve your best performance on the day itself. So just a reminder of what the, what the course is about. Uh, it's um, 174 kilometers, it's uh, 5,000 meters of climbing, and that's over 65 kilometers uh, of climbing. So this, by any standards, is a major physical and mental challenge. Uh, and as, uh, as you, you will all be aware, the, the Marmot is the, the, the mother or father of all the, uh, the sportives in, in France. It's really the, the big one that everybody wants to do at least, uh, at least once in their lives. Uh, and um, of course, once you've done it once, you want to come back again to get a better result. It's a mythical event. Um, and it's uh, and it's every time it's a massive challenge. So let's see how to get the best we how to do the best we can. There are two essentials for a good result at the Marmot. Uh, the first is to get get your pacing right, especially on the climbs, of course, uh, which I remind you total sixty five kilometers. And the second essential is to get your fueling right, uh, drinking and eating so that you don't run out of energy halfway around the course. Get those two right, and uh, all other things being equal, you will have a, 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 an excellent day on the bike. Now, talking about a pacing strategy doesn't make much sense until we understand what the objective of the individual person is. So your pacing strategy depends on your personal objective. You might be trying to win, if you're one of the 10 or 12 people that have a serious uh, um, chance to win, most likely you're looking to do a personal best uh, or to set a really good time if it's your first time. In some cases, many people uh, are uh, just uh, hoping to finish within the delay, within the time limit. And some people are simply there to enjoy the ride and to experience this, this mythical event. Each of these objectives requires a slightly different pacing strategy. So I'm gonna look at each of them briefly in turn. The first one is to win. If, if you want to win, you have no choice. You've got to ride with the lead group from the beginning, stay with them all along and bide your time to place your, to place your attack uh, which is most likely going to be on the final climb. Yeah, it's not impossible, of course, to do, to do it earlier and to ride away from everybody if you're clearly stronger than everybody else, but usually the Marmot is won by someone breaking away uh, on the final climb. That, again, only applies to a very, very small number of people. I, 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 I'm guessing, but I assume most people on the call uh, are probably interested in getting a personal best. So it's not a question of riding at the pace of the lead group, it's a question of climbing at the highest pace that you can sustain for the 65 kilometers of climbing. You need to ride as close as possible to your limits, but never go over them. You might, for example, gain two to three minutes on the glandon if you hit the glandon very hard from the beginning, but that is almost certain to cost you 10 minutes or more on the later climbs. Much better to start with a steady pace and keep that same pace all the time. So what pace is that going to be? Well, for most people, it'll be 70 to 75% of your FTP, your functional threshold power, or the same percentage, 70 to 75% of your uh, maximum heart rate. And this will, uh, this corresponds to your upper, the upper part of your zone two, the endurance zone. And that'll be the maximum sustainable pace that you can hold throughout the marmot. If you're particularly well trained and if you're a strong rider, someone that can finish in the top thousand or certainly the top 500, you should be able to push this a little higher and perhaps ride at 80%, uh, which is then well into the tempo zone. Um, but if you're not sure about it, better to be conservative. It's, it's always easier to go faster 
towards the sec in the second half of the event, uh, or, or certainly on the final climb, than it is to um, to maintain a pace which was too fast from the beginning. If your objective is simply to finish, then the best you can do is to climb at a steady pace to make sure you beat the cutoff. So work backwards from the cutoff time at Bourg d'Oison, which is six o'clock. If you reach Bourg d'Oison after six o'clock, you, you, you will be allowed to, you can still ride up the road to, to, to Alpha Joe's, but you will not be a finisher. They will take your bib away from you at the foot of the, at the, foot of the climb. So you will not be an official finisher. So what you need to do then is to work backwards from that six o'clock cutoff and figure out, well, in that case, what time do I need to be on the summit of the Galibier? And perhaps what time do I need to be at the foot of the telegraph? And then try and adjust the speed you're riding at so that you're well within those times to the extent you're able to, of course. Okay, so that's how to make sure you finish within the cutoff you're likely to be riding at 65 to 70% of your FTP or, or, or your maximum heart rate. That, that's a, probably a, a, a good target um, when your goal is just to finish. If your goal is just to enjoy the ride, which is a perfectly uh, acceptable goal, uh, and, and if you know, many people ride the Marmot who are not competitive and don't, couldn't care less whether they finish at, in the fight, in you know, in the in the in the two thousandth place or the three thousandth place or, or or later, this objective is rather different to to others to the other ones because enjoy the ride means different things to different people. Uh, for some people, it, enjoying the ride means they finish. So in that case, you need to apply the strategy I just talked about if you if you need to finish. For other people, it's it really is about enjoying the day out on the bike, uh, probably with friends you're riding with. Uh, and ignoring the competition and, and just just enjoying being in, in, in with other riders and uh, and riding an iconic route. In, in that case, ignore everybody else. Take advantage of the scenery. Ride at the pace you feel like. And if you if you finish, great. If you don't finish, it doesn't matter. You've enjoyed the ride. Okay, so that's it for for pacing. I will come back uh, on pacing during and when we look at the uh, in a few minutes when we look at the. Um, at the course broken down section by section. But now let's look at uh, fueling. Whether you get this right or wrong, whether you get your fueling right or wrong will have a massive impact on your performance. So it's, it's really important to, to get this right. You need to be aware that riding the marmot will Cost, cost you in energy terms roughly 5,000 calories. Uh, it may be slightly less, it may be quite, maybe a bit more, particularly if you're a, a heavier person and if you're going to take longer, but 5,000 is a good sort of starting point. 5,000 calories is a lot. Um, most, most men uh, during the day uh, living a normal office life will, can, will not burn more than 2,000, 2,200. So we're well over double the normal amount. And this is additional, of course, to that normal amount in any case. There's no way to consume this much during the event. If we do a quick calcul cal calculation. Uh, one energy bar is worth between 100 and 200 calories, depending on the bar. Uh, so you would need to consume at least 25 bars which is obviously uh, way too much. You'd be sick <laughs> long before you got to the, the 20th bar. It's still less than 25th. So, um, so it's not possible to, um, uh, to consume that on the bike. So what you need to do is start with an, uh, an absolutely full tank. In the old days, we talked about um, pasta parties. Uh, and the night before the, the race, people would eat huge quantities of pasta in order to carb load. The theory was correct, uh, but the timing was wrong. The Friday night dinner is too late for a Saturday night event. You should carb load on Wednesday and Thursday. So by all means, have, have, have a pasta party on Wednesday or Thursday or eat large amounts of potatoes or rice or whatever it may be. 
And if Friday should be a relatively normal dinner, yes, perhaps a bit heavier on the carbs than usual, but not in a huge quantity. Eat a normal quantity because you need to be able to digest it before the following morning. So the carbs can be, again, rice, uh, rice potatoes or pasta uh, or other things, but those are the three easiest to get hold of in, in, in El Pidues or Bulgari. Then take your breakfast three hours before the start. I know this means getting up in the middle of the night, uh, but I do recommend setting the alarm for the middle of the night, eating uh, a quick uh, breakfast, and then going back to sleep again. That gives you the gives your body the chance to to digest it, and and then you're ready to go at the start. You can. The alternative, of course, is to eat an hour and a half or an hour before, get up, and then eat an hour and a half or an hour before. Uh, the, the risk of that, of course, is you haven't properly digested when, when, the, uh, when it comes to the start. Now, the amount you, you're going to need um, during the day, uh, we've said you're going to spend 5,000. You don't actually need to consume 5,000 calories. The amount you need depends on the relative percentage of carbohydrate to fat that your body uses while you're climbing at, your, at the pace you're going to be climbing at. This is highly individual uh, and it's something you can train, uh, but of course it's now way too late to change anything for this year. So you're gonna have to go with whatever you've got. So the actual amount you can, you're going to consume depends on what you're used to doing in training. Our recommendation is from the start to consume somewhere between 250 and 500 calories per hour. The research shows that if you can consume 500 calories per hour, it is beneficial, but you won't be able to do it if you haven't practiced it. So, so, so don't, you know, if you haven't practiced it, don't try. Uh, what, what you can consume depends upon what you're used to. You might be able to increase it a little bit, but you won't be able to increase it dramatically. Do see, so, so you, you can see the, uh, the calorie value of, tip, of, of, of the usual sorts of things you're gonna be eating. So a bottle of uh, normal strength energy mix is around 120 calories. A gel is between 80 and 120. A bar is, is, in, is anywhere between 100 and 200, it varies quite widely between bars. Uh, and a banana is typically between 100 and 150, depending how big it is and how ripe it is. Uh, so the, the guideline is to eat between two, eat or drink, if you've got energy drink in your bottle, between two and four of those items per hour. As much as you think you can your stomach can reasonably handle. So on to the, uh, onto the, the course itself. We can break it down into seven distinct sections that we'll look at section by section because each of them has a, has a, has a different characteristic and therefore a different way to, to, to ride it. But first, before the start, it's important to warm up well, and especially if you've, if you've ridden down from Alpa Duez. You know, a lot of people stay in hotels up on Alpa Duez, uh, and therefore, of course, you're gonna to have to get up quite early and cycle down the mountain to be at the start. It's going to be very cold at the, uh, on, on Alpa Duez first thing in the morning, uh, at six o'clock, it'll be between six and seven degrees, according to the, the latest weather forecast. Uh, so that, that's seriously cold to start a long descent. If the clothes you're going to carry with you during the race are not enough and you're going to be too cold on that descent, then the best tip is to wear something disposable. Uh, you often see people wearing um, bin bags uh, uh, over their bodies, even over their legs, taped over their legs and so on. Rubber gloves, if you're not planning to take long gloves with you. Um, and then you can dump those in a bin, of course, just before you start somewhere down in, uh, in Bourgoisin. So do, once you're down at the bottom, do warm up, take uh, 15 or 20 minutes on the, on the flat area around Bourgoisin to warm up, and then get in the pen, I recommend 30 to 40 minutes before the start, um, otherwise you're going to find yourself at the back of, of, of one or of, of a thousand or, or 1200 riders, uh, which is not really the best place to be. When you're in there, try to stay as warm as possible uh, and hydrated. Keep sipping, just sip frequently on your drink so that you remain uh, hydrated. The temperature in the sas in Bourgoisin is going to be uh, is going to be around ten degrees, so it's it's not exactly warm. 
Well, so that's for the uh, before the start. Now let's look at the first part of the uh, of the race, the first section, which is the 15k out from the start itself to the foot of the Glendon. Uh, it's very much like a drag race. Every year, it's exactly the same. It starts very very fast. Uh, the reason is it's a wide, fast road. It's close to traffic. Um, everybody's full of adrenaline. Everybody is cold they want to start going so boom off it goes and of course the faster riders want to get out of the get ahead and get away from the slower riders anyway it's essential to pick the right wheel to follow and judge the pace right for you uh, from the start this is not the moment to go into the red and uh, go in the red and start um, using a huge amount of energy to try and hang on to wheels of, of riders who are much stronger than you are it's not going to do you any good at all. You're just going to tie yourself out uselessly, and then you'll you'll waste you'll lose a lot of time later on. So take it to, by all means, uh, ride at a good pace, uh, but don't go faster than you're than you're able to sustain. Beware of the the climb to the dam after um, uh, the first uh, 10 10k or so. There's a there's a kilometer climb up to the dam. Um, which uh, which is around five percent. It's it's not so it's not very steep, but it's quite a shock to the system, and then it flattens off again. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, flashed up on your screen. Um, Zoom has just told me the meeting will end in ten minutes. I don't know. I don't understand what's going on. Normally, uh, uh, normally it's a forty minute meeting. It's a free Zoom account, but it's normally forty minutes. For some reason, it's uh, cutting off in. Uh, in, 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 in 20 or 25 minutes. If it does cut us off, which it, uh, it did on the French one as well, there's nothing else to do but to log back in again, uh, and then we restart, and then it gives us, a, it gives us the time again. So, so apologies if that happens, just log back in, uh, and we'll restart wherever we, uh, wherever we got cut off. Okay, we've got 10 minutes, so anyway, that's, that's for sure. All right, so that's for the first section. The second section, of course, is the climb to the Glendon itself, which is the first serious climb, 23 kilometers, over a thousand meters to climb. And uh, the same thing happens here every year as well. Of course, you, people will ride very hard to the foot, but then they keep riding very hard up the initial slopes. Every group attacks those, the initial slopes of the Glendon at a pace that's far too high to sustain to the summit of the Glendon. Uh, and let alone, of course, um, uh, continue on for, for, for the, rest of the, uh, the rest of the event. So the single most important piece of advice for riding the Marmot is, is this one. From the start of the Glendon onwards, set your own pace at your own rhythm and ignore anyone that overtakes you. Either they're stronger than you and, and you can't stay with them anyway, or they're not stronger than you, they're burning themselves out and you will catch them later, it's guaranteed. Okay, you'll achieve your best time by keeping a constant level of intensity on all the climbs. Okay, which, uh, uh, let me remind you, it adds up to a total of 65 kilometers of climbing. So if you have a power meter, stick to your target power output, uh, which should, uh, uh, again, should be, be probably 70 to 75% of your FTP. Don't be tempted to push it 10 watts or 20 watts faster. It's really easy to be suckered into that because of the adrenaline and because of everybody else that's overtaking you. Don't do it. If you don't have a power meter, use your, uh, use your, your heart rate monitor. Again, should be around 70 to 75% of your maximum heart rate. And if you don't have a uh, uh, that either, then you've got to go on feel and it should feel relatively easy and you should be able to talk to people around you you should be able to hold a relatively normal conversation. If you're struggling to spit out words one by one, you're going way too fast. Okay, so, so you would need to back off. Okay, it's a long way to the top of the Glendon, um, and it's just the start of the event. A reminder of the need to fuel all the way up the Glendon. If you, if you, if you don't fuel on the Glendon, then you'll, uh, you'll be digging deep into your reserves and you can never replenish them. You, you can't play catch up. So make sure you take on board somewhere between four and eight of those food items on the gland or whether they be gels, uh, a, bo a bottle of uh, energy drink, of course, uh, or, or bars or whatever it is that you, you personally prefer eating. 
Once you reach the summit, there's a feed station. Uh, you, you will need to stop there to fill your bottles, uh, possibly to grab something to eat. Uh, it will be very cold on Saturday, probably no more than six degrees up there, uh, first thing in the morning, uh, the time when you're there. Uh, so you want to spend the least time possible. You really want to grab and go. Put a jacket on, put your long, long fingered gloves on if you have them, um, and, and, and over you go as quickly as you can so, so your muscles don't stiffen up and you don't freeze on the, on the way down. The first part of the descent is difficult and dangerous. That's why it's untimed. Uh, stay concentrated, take care. This is it'll be very silly to have an accident in the first part of that descent. Okay, the second part of the descent is a, is, is a, lot, a lot more straightforward. Uh, take the opportunity to eat and drink on the second part um, and uh, then, then you'll arrive at the bottom in good shape. The third, uh, sorry, the fourth part of the of the marmot then is the valley from the bottom of the Glandon uh, all the way up uh, up the valley. It's a it's a false flat climb, only two hundred meters climbing in uh, over twenty two kilometers, so less than one percent. Um, and uh, uh, there's um, so it's really important to ride in a group. Your goal is to reach the foot of the telegraph at the end of that long valley with the least amount, using the least amount of energy to get there. So that means staying in a group, spinning your legs and uh, taking advantage of the, of, of, of the group to reduce the, uh, um, the air resistance, obviously. Eat and drink all along. I, I know I keep repeating this, but I can't repeat it often enough. Now, uh, riding in a group, it's easy to say, it's a little bit less easy to do sometimes. If, if you get dropped out of the group, then don't uh, push hard on your own, but just back off. The next group will be very, very quickly behind you. It's probably no more than a minute behind. Uh, so if you pedal easily for uh, one or two minutes, the, the next group will come up and, and sweep you up with them. One, one idea when you get to the bottom of the descent of the Glandon, if you're, more, if you're pretty much on your own when you get to the bottom, just wait before the timing mat. You're untimed, so it's not costing you any time at all. Uh, officially, uh, uh, wait until uh, a, a group of people arrives and then cross the timing mat with them. That's uh, an efficient way to uh, to begin the, the the climb up the valley. Okay, so then we'll then you arrive at the foot of the telegraph and of course the Galibia, which is immediately behind it. Uh, this is the obviously the biggest. Uh, the, the biggest effort of the day is getting up to the top of the Galibier. From the start of the telegraph, it's 35 kilometers, uh, almost 2,000 meters of climbing with a short descent in the middle. The goal here is to keep a steady pace, never go in the red, and keep eating and drinking. The two climbs are quite different. The telegraph is, uh, is a wide road. Uh, it's quite shady uh, for much of it. Uh, it's a steady gradient, 7% most of the time. Um, and so really fairly straightforward. You can take a, a you can get, get, a rhythm, get a good rhythm going and just drive up at that, uh, at that same pace. So it's, it's important to get the pace right uh, and then just keep it steady. Uh, after the telegraph is the short descent to Valois. It's, it's only five kilometers. So, so you, you're through that in barely five minutes. And then the Galibier starts. So the Galibier is much more irregular than the, than the, than the telegraph. The, the road's a bit narrow. It's high altitude, of course, when you get near the end, uh, and it feels never ending. The slope's never extremely steep, except uh, at, the, at the beginning and the end. The first kilometer and last kilometer are at around 11%. Uh, but what makes it really tough is the altitude. Uh, you'll definitely feel it for the last three, four, maybe five kilometers. Um, and of course, it's uh, you've already done the gland on, you've already done the telegraph, so you're, 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 you're quite tired by the time you get here. Don't be surprised if your power falls off near the top. That's normal because of the, uh, the, 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 the reduced oxygen. Your power could easily be down by five, six, seven percent. And that, that is normal. Don't, don't try to force it to, uh, to stay higher. On the top, there's a, um, there's a, the, the, there's a feed station. You, you'll definitely need to refill your bottles and grab something to eat. Again, it will be cold. It's a, there's a possibility of rain. 
Uh, so you definitely don't want to waste any time up there, but grab, make sure you've got full bottles and something to eat, because it's essential during the long descent uh, down to Bourg-Doisel uh, to refuel, to get yourself ready for the climb up to, up to Alpages. That descent is 45 kilometers, uh, almost 2,000 meters of descending. Um, the first part is really fast off the Galibier. Once you get to the Col du Lotare, the road becomes wide, um, and the uh, um, and, and the slope is a little bit less. There, it's essential to be in a group um, because there's often a headwind, um, and if you're on your own, you'll 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 lose um, probably five five or more kilometers per hour compared to riding in a group. Ideally, you want to stay with the same group until you reach a Bourg Doisel. Beware of several dark tunnels. Uh, it's important to have a red light for the back of, uh, on the back of your bike so that people behind you don't run into you. Um, and beware also of a couple of somewhat unexpected short climbs towards the end of that long descent, uh, which can cause cramps if you, if you take them too hard and if you, if you weren't, weren't expecting them. So when you finally reach Bourg d'Oiseau, the first thing to do is to stop at the feed station. It will take, take you anywhere between one hour if you're fast and strong, uh, up to two hours or possibly even more to reach the top uh, at, at, in Alpe d'Huez. So for that, you will definitely need at least one full water bottle, perhaps two, and definitely something to eat, uh, two, two, three, perhaps even four items of food to eat on your, on your way up. It's a long, long way from finished. And uh, the climb to Alpe d'Huez is in many respects the hardest point of the day. So make sure you've got what you need to get up there. The first three kilometers are very hard. Those are the steep ramps. Yes, it eases off uh, in each of the, uh, the hairpin bends, but the ramps are very steep, uh, as much as 13% in places. So I strongly recommend that you take the first three kilometers until you reach the, the village of Lagarde very easy. Back off, if, you, if, you, if you've been riding at, let's say, 200 watts, then back right off and only take that at 170, 180 maximum. Uh, try to spin as much as you can. Uh, it's hard to spin on 13%, but uh, keep, the, keep the pressure off until you're through that steep, steep bit, through Legard, and then there's eight kilometers to go. Um, sorry, uh, almost 10 kilometers to go still and you can progressively uh, increase the power and accelerate a little bit because the road, uh, the slope gets, gets significantly easier. Now, from this point on, the energy you save by pacing yourself right uh, in the early part of the day will start to pay back in minutes. If you've managed your effort just right, you'll be able to accelerate progressively, at, at finishing perhaps even at the highest intensity of the day, and you should be overtaking many, many riders, dozens of riders, perhaps even uh, as many as 100 riders in the last few kilometers. So good luck with that. I um, hope very much it works out uh, that way for you. If you follow the uh, suggestions, then it certainly should. Now, let's uh, um, move on to the most important errors to avoid in the, uh, during your ride. Okay, so here are five mistakes that you should try and avoid during your ride. The first one, of course, we've already discussed, it's starting out too fast. Start out too fast and you'll run into trouble uh, in the middle or certainly by the end. The second is similar to that, it's, it's burning too many matches. By burning too many matches, I mean uh, making too, too many high intensity efforts to stay in a group, uh, for example, on the, uh, on the long... Uh, the long ride up the valley of the Morienne, or even on the ride back down from the, from the Galibier, uh, if you're regularly pushing 350, 400, 450 watts to stay in the group, then you're going to really pay for that when you reach to Alpha Juez. Forgetting to eat or drink is an obvious uh, error, uh, but very, very easy to do. Taking silly risks when descending, you're, you're not a professional. Um, you're, um, you probably don't descend a uh, roads like, like off the Galibier very often. Uh, so just back off a little bit. Don't try necessarily to follow the person in front at the same speed. They may be a much better descender than you. 
descend at your own pace, your own within your ability and stay safe. Uh, and then finally, uh, inappropriate clothing can uh, really um, uh, spoil your ride for you. Uh, it's going to be a, a very cold day on top of the coals, uh, forecast six or seven degrees, but it will be hot in the valley. Uh, at saint jean de Morienne in the middle of the valley, the forecast is for between 20 and 23 degrees and sunny uh, in the middle of the day. So you've got to be able to manage those two extremes. The best way to do that is to have different layers of clothing that you can uh, take off and put back on again as required. Uh, easily adaptable clothing. So things like arm warmers, long gloves, of course, for the descent, a rain jacket. There is definitely a risk of rain on the Garibier. Um, so you need the rain jacket and the long gloves. Otherwise, your descent from there will be a nightmare. Uh, you may want a cap or, or a bonnet uh, to put under your helmet. Uh, you may want a, a neck warmer uh, and perhaps even leg warmers. So how to carry all of that? plus the food, of course, that you need between the feed stations. There are really two options. It's either to put them somewhere on your bike, uh, for which you'll need a decent saddlebag or, 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 or perhaps a bag on the handlebars or, or, or behind the stem. Or one uh, old school tip is simply to wear two cycling jerseys, which gives you a dub double the number of pockets. Uh, yes, it bulks out a little bit on your back, um, but that's not really a major issue. And you can, uh, you, instead of just three pockets, you've got six. So that's, uh, that's, that's a, a tip which can really work in circumstances like this one, where the weather is not going to be too hot most of the time. So just, there might be, you'll be spending it half an hour or so um, being too hot and the rest of the time you're going to be, um, you should be okay. So wearing, wearing two jerseys, it shouldn't be an issue. Okay, five go faster tips for um, um, extra speed, extra and saving time. Uh, the first is quite simply to check your bike before the start. Make sure there's absolute, it's in tip top condition. There's nothing wrong with it. Your brakes are not rubbing. There's no transmission problems or uh, anything else. Your chain's well oiled and so on and so forth. So either check it yourself if you have the competence or else get to get a mechanic to check it for you. Secondly, is make sure when you're climbing that you're climbing efficiently, so all your energy is going into your legs and there's no wasted energy. Uh, so what I mean by that is you should be climbing with your upper body as still and relaxed as possible. The only movement when you're climbing should be from your hips down. So all your energy should be focused into your legs. And if you find yourself pulling on the bars or tensing your arms or tensing, tensing your shoulders, you're wasting energy, which, uh, which, which is not available to, to drive you and uh, your bike up the hill. One useful tip when climbing on steeper slopes is to drop your heels, push down harder on your heels uh, rather than on your toes as you're, as you're pedaling. Uh, and the final tip for climbing efficiently is to stand up regularly on the pedals, but always at a lower cadence. If you stand up at the same cadence and keep the same cadence that you were using when you were seated, your heart rate will spike. Uh, so better to take to either use the fact that the slope changes and suddenly becomes steeper, or else change gear a couple of times so that your cadence drops down. And what I normally do is target a cadence around 45 to 50 RPM when I'm standing, and that way my heart rate stays uh, nice and low. The third uh, go faster tip is uh, more about saving time, of course, than speed. It's uh, minimize your stops. You must stop, uh, of course, to pick up water and, and food. Um, but um, any time you're stopped, you're not making progress. So make the stops as quick as possible. Grab what you need and go uh, without wasting any time. Uh, the fourth, it's, it always surprises me how many people don't seem to pedal downhill, how often they, they, just, they just let the bike coast downhill. There are two reasons why that's a mistake. Um, the first is, of course, you're, you're, wasting, uh, you're wasting an opportunity to, to, to go faster. If you pedal when get going downhill, you're going to add two, three, four, five kilometers an hour to your speed, uh, which will, of course, increase your average speed over the whole event and therefore reduce your time. Uh, so that's the first point. Obviously, this doesn't apply to when it's very steep. 
um, but a good part of the descents uh, can be pedaled, can and should be pedaled. And the second reason for pedaling when going downhill is it keeps the blood flowing in your legs and thus evacuating the toxins um, and, um, and preparing your legs better for, the, for the, uh, the next climb. So do pedal when you're going downhill. And the fifth uh, go faster technique is, is a mental one. It's, uh, I call it use your head. Uh, so when the going gets really tough and when you start asking yourself, what am I doing here? And wouldn't it be much easier just to stop? Um, you've got to combat that with um, some mental strategies. You, you can become your own worst energy when the time when the going gets really tough uh, and your head will make you stop before your body will. It may feel like your body is telling you to stop, but it's actually your head uh, that is saying, I don't want to do this any longer. So three possible strategies. The first is positive self-talk. You simply tell yourself you're doing great. Uh, you've come a long way. Um, look at all the training you've done. You've made a huge effort to get here. You've made a huge effort throughout the day to get to where you are now. You're not going to give it up now. Come on, there's only half an hour or an hour left, whatever it may be. Um, you've done great so far. Keep it going. Come on. Come on, guys. Keep it going. Keep it going. So that's the first uh, strategy, positive self-talk. The second is to distract yourself from the effort and the, the, the feeling of, 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 of pain, if you will. Uh, so distract yourself by, by repeating a mantra, um, if, you, if you have one, or, re or perhaps um, uh, uh, reciting a poem or reciting a song, or simply think of something else. Anything that can distract your brain for a while from, uh, from what's going on in your legs. And the third strategy is, is, is rather an opposite one. It's focus your attention on what you're doing, um, but specifically on your technique, uh, on how you're pedaling, on how you're relaxing your upper body, on how you're standing up and that type of thing. Um, or, or focus your, uh, yourself on the rider in front and see how he's doing, uh, and he or she, and stay as close as possible to that person. Don't let them edge away from you. So those are three possible mental strategies to help you through the rough patches. So those five tips we've just seen are important, um, but they're nothing compared to the two essential elements that I mentioned at the beginning and have talked frequently about to, uh, throughout this presentation, which are to get the pacing right, especially on the climbs, and to fuel consistently uh, from start to finish. Fueling, of course, including both drinking and eating. Those are the two th most essential things. Get those right, and you should have a good day on the bike. So that brings me to the end. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, thank you for your patience with the Zoom problem. I'm sorry it cut out in the middle. I don't know why that happens, because normally it, it lasts for 40 minutes. Um, let me wish you good luck for the, for the day on Saturday. I'm afraid I won't be there. I would love to meet you in person, but um, due to the change of date, I cannot be there. Um, but do, uh, do, do come and see us on another occasion for your training needs. Uh, for, for your, for if, you, if you'd like to join us for a training camp and if you're interested in talking about coaching, let me know. Uh, drop me an email. I'd be delighted to hear from you. If you have any questions about this presentation or any comments, any feedback, I would love to hear as well. And I will reply to you very, very quickly. Do you have any tips for the possible rain to come? Uh, about how to handle that? Yeah, sure. I mean, the first thing is you, you need to have the right um, clothes with you. So at the very least, have a rain jacket. Um, and um, I would strongly recommend having um, long fingered gloves that are reasonably waterproof or else neoprene. Um, because um, coming off the glandon, if it's raining and if it's six degrees, your fingers are going to freeze in short fingered gloves. Mm, okay, that's a good tip indeed. So very strongly re recommend that. Of course, if it is raining and the road is wet, it hasn't rained for a while, so uh, the road will be slippery. So be very, very careful on the descents. You, you, you're just, you're gonna mm -hmm. have to slow down on the descents and take the corners more carefully than you would otherwise. Okay, will do, indeed. Uh, no need uh, to take so many risks. No, there's no point. You're not a professional, um, I presume. 
And, no, and, no, absolutely not. And you need to go to work on uh, on Monday, most likely. Um, you've probably got a family and so on. So yeah, don't, don't. There's no point in taking risks. It's not worth it. Okay. Thanks a lot for the info and uh, the presentation. It was really really helpful. So uh, thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure.